Hi guys, Miss Francis here. Um, I just want to do a review quickly of transcription before we move on to RNA modification, which occurs at the very end of transcription. Um, so we've done DNA replication. Now we're doing DNA transcription, where transcription involves DNA being transcribed into RNA. And really, it's being transcribed into pre-mRNA first, and then it's being um, modified and will become messenger RNA. So something important, we're talking about DNA pairing with RNA, not DNA pairing with a DNA like it does in replication. So instead of A matching with a T, A matches with U, C still matches with G, T still matches with A, and G still matches with C. Now transcription occurs in the nucleus when we're talking about eukaryotes, because remember, in prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, <clears throat> so it takes place in their nucleoid, nucleoid region, which is in their cytoplasm. So transcription occurs in three stages. You've got initiation, you've got elongation, and then you've got termination. So initiation starts when these transcription factors bind to the Tata box. So the transcription factors, um, they can include Tata binding proteins, um, basal factors, um, co-activators, and they're going to bind to what's called the Tata box, which is located in the promoter region. And that stabilizes RNA polymerase and tells RNA pol polymerase that this is the location for transcription. Now we've got activators, and the activators are a regulatory protein that are going to bind to the enhancer. The enhancer is just a different region on our strand of DNA. So now this enhancer region on the DNA loops over, and now those activators that are bound to the enhancer region bind to the transcription factors. And now we've got our initiation complex. And this tells RNA polymerase to begin, meaning essentially that the gene is turned on. But let's say I want to turn the gene on off. So instead of activators bind, you're going to have repressors, which is a different regulatory protein, that are located at the silencer region because that's where they bind. The repressors are going to bind to the transcription factors when that DNA strand loops over. And now the repressors stop transcription and our gene is turned off. Then we've got elongation. So during elongation, the RNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the three prime end of our strand. Then we have termination. Termination occurs after the RNA polymerase transcribes a terminator sequence. So now we've got our pre-mRNA. And that pre-mRNA is going to be modified. So I want to switch back to our regular um, PowerPoint that we use for our note packet, and then we'll come back and revisit this. So eukaryotic cells modify RNA after transcription. So we've got our pre-mRNA, which happens after transcription. I know I said RNA up here, but technically I'm talking pre-RNA. Um, and we want to protect this pre-messenger RNA before it leaves the nucleus, because outside of the nucleus and the cytoplasm, we have all these hydrolytic enzymes. So we want to give this RNA a cap and we want to give it a tail. So on the five prime end, we have a modified form of guanine that acts as the cap. And it has two main functions. It's going to help protect that messenger RNA from those hydrolytic enzymes. And it also functions as an attach here signal for the ribosome. Well, at the other end, we also want to protect that too, right? We want to protect the three prime end. What we've got there is something called the poly A tail. And it's basically just 50 to 250 repeated adenine nucleotides. This tail also inhibits hydrolysis of the messenger RNA by the hydrolytic enzymes. 
It also facilitates ribosome attachment, but it also seems to facilitate the export of the messenger RNA from the nucleus. Now, the most remarkable stage of RNA processing occurs during the removal of a large portion of the RNA molecule, which is called RNA splicing. So in our pre-mRNA, we've actually got non-coding segments and coding segments. The non-coding segments are called introns and they lie in between the coding regions. The final messenger RNA includes just those coding regions, which are called exons, which can then be translated, not transcribed, translated, because translation is going to happen next, into amino acid sequences. So let me show you what I mean. Do you see how we've got these sections called introns? Those are non-coding regions found between exons that have our coding regions. We've got our poly A tail and our cap to protect the, mes the pre-messenger RNA. Once that pre-messenger RNA goes through splicing, we only have the exon remaining. And now the exon contains the coding segment. And now we've got our pre, sorry, now we've got our messenger RNA. So how does this happen? Well, the splicing is accomplished by a spliceosome, where the spliceosome consists of proteins and what are called SNRPs, small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. And then each SNRP has several protein molecules and small nuclear RNA molecules. So let me show you what I mean. So here you've got your spliceosome. The spliceosome is made up of proteins and SNRPs, and inside the SNRP, you've got proteins and snRNA. So within the spliceosome, the snRNA base pairs with nucleotides at the end of the intron. So that's what's going on right there. The RNA transcript is then cut to release the intron and then the exons are spliced together, so they're connected. The spliceosome then comes apart, releasing its components and also releasing the messenger RNA, which now only contains the exons. They're not showing the, um, the tail, but it also has the poly A tail. So you might be asking yourself, well, why would I have these non-coding regions? Why would I create an extra step for myself to remove these non-coding regions? Well, the presence of introns potentially increases, uh, it does increase, sorry, the probability of potentially beneficial crossing over. Because remember, the greater the distance between the genes on a chromosome, the more likely crossing over is going to occur. And this can lead to new proteins that have new functions, which can end up being beneficial. This is how evolution happens, guys. So now I'm going to flip back to that review PowerPoint so that we can just kind of summarize everything that we just talked about. So we know that the RNA is modified before leaving the nucleus. We get a guanine cap and we've got a poly A tail. Now the guanine cap is at the five prime end. It protects that RNA from hydrolytic enzymes and it signals to the ribosomes like, hey, this is where you attach. At the three prime end, we have our poly A tail, which is just 50 to 250 repeated adenine nucleotides. This tail also protects the RNA from hydrolytic enzyme. It also signals the attach here for ribosomes, but it also facilitates the export of the messenger RNA from the nucleus. So after the RNA leaves the nucleus, it gets further processed. So technically, we still have pre-mRNA. The non-coding segments, the introns are removed, and then the coding segments, the exons, are joined to form this messenger RNA with continuous coding sequence. 
So how is the splicing done? The splicing is done by a spliceosome. So here we've got our spliceosome. The spliceosome is made up of proteins and SNRPs. And then within your SNRP, you've got proteins and snRNA. The snRNA inside that spliceosome pairs with nucleotides at the end of the introns. Then the introns are released, so here are the introns, and then the exons are spliced together, they're joined. The spliceosome comes apart, releases its components, and releases our messenger RNA that only contains the exons, it only contains the coding regions. So that's our um, finishing of transcription. Next, we're going to look at translation.